Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be back at the home of the Protestant Reformation in America, Believer's Chapel. I have, uh, through our good friend Peter Lilback, I have narratives of the Gospel of John that you can give out to anyone that you engage and talk to about our Lord. Uh, you can leave this for them. On the back, they have a little web icon, and if they will, if they will hit that with their phone, there is somebody that will pick up on that back at Westminster Seminary and interact with them, answer questions, and so forth. So I thought I would. I said, Peter, send me some. He sent me a case. So you're going to have plenty. I'm going to leave these up here for you. And once again, it's a great joy to be back with you teaching the scriptures. And we are in Proverbs chapter 22. And we are beginning this morning in verse 10. I don't really know why I was so enthusiastic about this lesson because when I turned it in to Stephanie, I listed far more Proverbs than I could possibly go through this morning. So I'm going to limit this to five uh, verses 10 through 14 this morning. Here is our first, drive out the mocker so that contention, that's an interesting word, quarrel, strife, you may have, might depart and strife and grace might cease. 11, as for the one who loves a pure heart, and whose lips are gracious, the king is his friend. Twelve, the eyes of the Lord protect knowledge, and so he subverts the words of the treacherous man. Thirteen, the sluggard says, a lion is outside in the midst of the street. Actually, the word is plaza, and that is your translation if you have an NIV, but you may have street and that's okay. Uh, and then his testimony, I will be as good as murdered. And here's our final one for the morning. A deep pit is the mouth of an unfaithful wife. The one who is cursed of the Lord falls into it. Now, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs and what I believe is the thrust of the proverb itself. Verse 10, the will of God is peace. The will of God is peace. Verse 11, the wise become close to power. The wise become close to power. Twelve, the knowledge of God is supreme over all. The knowledge of God is supreme over all. And verse 13, let's put all anxiety away. Let's put all anxiety away. And here's 14, the curse falls upon the man. The curse falls upon the man. Well, here's our exposition this morning from the book of Proverbs, beginning in verse 10. 
Drive out the mocker so that contention might depart. Mockers, we have learned, are the worst form of the fool. They are the hardened of all sinners. And notice we open the top line with a command. We are to drive out the mocker. A mocker is not only disruptive, but there is a clear intent in the proverb in so doing. And it's spelled out. You see where that clause is. So that strife, contention, quarrels cease. That's the purpose of the activity. This verb to drive is an interesting study in itself. And it has, surprisingly, fraught with theological content even for us today. The verb to drive is found, first of all, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. The Lord drove out the man and the woman from the east side of the garden. Genesis 4.14, Cain whines after killing, murdering his brother. You have driven, same verb, just different tense. You have driven me from the ground. Deuteronomy 33.27, Moses commands the children of Israel, drive out the enemy before you. But here's where it gets interesting. Joshua chapter 24, uh, 29, 18. It's the same verb. And Joshua said that the Lord is the one who drove out all the people, the Canaanites who lived in the land. So there's a tension with the verb. Uh, Moses told the children of Israel, you drive them out. And yet afterwards, when they occupy the land, Joshua said it was actually the Lord himself that did the driving. So what's happening here? What's the tension? The command is to do. And Joshua says that it actually was God working in and through the people. Now, that's where it's helpful to come over to the New Testament. And you have a text like Philippians 2, 12, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then the very next verse explains it. And that begins with a four, an explanation, for it is God who is working in you, through you, to accomplish His will. That's what we're talking about here. The will of God for the wise is to drive out the mocker. And the result is the will of God is established and peace ensues. That was the idea of to drive. Augustine put it together very well. He says, command what you will, will what you command. So you do the working, and as you do the working, God is working. And He's establishing His will as you and I work together. So, what's the proverb saying? He's saying, the mocker has to go. The hard-hearted fool must be evicted. Foolish behavior ruins relationships, friendships, all kinds of associations. That's what happens when sin becomes involved. So what do we learn from this proverb as a backdrop? Well, we learn once again one of the presuppositions to theology, and that is that there is no common ground between the wise and the fool. There's nothing you can really agree upon. You can weigh and measure things, but when you get into opinions, there's a divergence, and you see the world entirely differently, and so there is no common ground. We follow the Scriptures, which in the Old Testament was the law. 
But the mocker, you see, he's a law all unto himself. His law is right here in his own heart. Therefore, he can't follow an external law, which is the word of God. And as a result, well, look how Solomon personifies this person. He does it with the word strife, contention, quarrels. This is what he is, and this is what he brings to every area of his life, contention. So he must depart. That's the wisdom. And separation in reality from this person is the will of God. And it is established to be the will of God, and that is the word drive. Why we study these words? Because they open up the scriptures to us. And now line two clarifies it, strife. David uses the word in Psalm 56, six. He says his enemies stir up strife, contention. They are a problem in his kingdom every day, he says. But that is not us. And the result, your proverb says, is disgrace, ignominy, dishonor. He loses his name. He loses his reputation. And as he's dealt with, the word gets out in the community. And this man who had credibility has now lost his credibility. He's burned it all away. And that's what happens. Look at this final word, cease, come to an end. It's used by God, interestingly, in Genesis 8.22 in his promise to Noah that he is not going to flood the earth again and that the earth is going to remain and it's not going to cease in the seasons of the year because he's never going to flood the earth again. And that's this final word. Peace is the will of God for the wise. And that is the proverb. Now here's 11. And beginning in 11, we have the mouth that reveals the heart. And we're going to have that in the next three proverbs. Here's the first. As for the one who loves a pure heart, whose lips are gracious, the king is the friend. Everything in the Proverbs begin with the heart. The heart is the center of the individual. Everything is attached to the heart, the way we think, the way we speak. Someone say to you, I really didn't mean to use those words. Well, yes, you did, because those words come from your heart you have obviously been thinking about them, you have been processing them, and that's why they came out. What comes out of the mouth is from the heart. The words of people are an expression of the heart. Look at this top line. The one who loves, loves an emotional feeling. It is a commitment. It is an attraction. It is an affirmation of the heart. And it causes one to seek, to set forth energy. Proverbs 8, 17, wisdom says, I love those who love me. And those who diligently seek me, find me. That's to love. Pure. Now, we are familiar with the word pure. We've seen it many times. Used of uncontaminated vessels in the temple. They had to be cleaned in a certain way. And also, the word pure was tied to the oil that lit the tabernacle. It had to be refined and made pure out there in the wilderness. That is the word. Here, it's tied to 
the gracious heart. Proverbs 15, 6, gracious words are pure words. So the king's friend is put on display by the language that he uses. That's affirmed to us by the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 12, 33 and 34. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit you brood of vipers said Jesus how can you speak good when you're evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks that's the Proverbs look at line two gracious lips and parallel with the heart that's found four separate places in the Proverbs. Gracious lips tied to the heart. The pure heart will produce a gracious mouth, gracious speech. That is the way we should be communicating with one another at all times. That is an expression of who we are as people. Now, here, the benefit, the outcome, is to have the king as a friend. The king, remember in Proverbs, is always the ideal. Not the wicked. He is the ideal of leadership. And he's put on display in the Proverbs that way. He Remember, he winnows the wicked from his presence and his throne room, his chamber. He drives a threshing sledge over them. He gets rid of them. The wicked don't appear before the king in the book of Proverbs. Here is the outcome then of your day to day. You have the king for a friend because you're a gracious person who speaks the truth from his heart. Who was a friend of the king? Well, Hushai was. Sam, 2 Samuel 15, 37, he's described as David's friend. An upright attitude, gracious words, gracious speech, that's a prerequisite to have the king as a friend. Now, we don't have kings here in America. We are not set up that way. So the king is in a different culture, in a different place. But let me tell you the significance of that word friend. It's the same word. That's the same word that's used of none other than Abraham, who was the friend of God. Close association. Confidant. You remember? Shall I hide from my friend Abram what I am about to do? It's fellowship. It's connection. Here's the way our Lord Jesus put it. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, what does that mean tied back to this proverb? Well, once again, it's the idea of proximity. The king is your friend. You see the king face to face. You're his confidant. And you see his face. You're not far away. You're close. That's what the Lord Jesus says are the pure in heart. They are the people who are close to me. And that's the proverb. Here's 12. The eyes of the Lord protect. The word can mean guard, knowledge. But he subverts the words of the treacherous man. We open with this top line, the eyes of the Lord, which is an anthropomorphism. It is applying a human element to 
the living God. The physical characteristic of man is applied to the invisible God. That's an anthropomorphism. And it stands as a figure for the Lord God Himself. So, He sees. Now that's important because Him seeing, He is going to deal with the wicked. This is a book of absolutes. It's a book of consequences. He sees. Therefore, He's going to act. Consequences from the book of consequences. Notice the top line. These eyes watch over, preserve. The lexicon translates this to guard. Proverbs 2.8, our verb here, guarding the course, guarding the path of the wise. That's what wisdom does. And it's matched by the word subvert. Translated to twist, to pervert, to frustrate, to overthrow. We actually translated this word back in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 3 as to ruin. A man's own folly ruins his own life. Now, notice all the action here is tied around knowledge. You see that? Knowledge in Proverbs is revelation. It's the Scriptures. It's the Word coming from the burning bush. It's the mouth of God Himself. That's what knowledge is in the revelation of Proverbs. So if you walk in a means or a manner of wisdom, then you're walking with great skill because you're walking according to His Word. And that's the idea. The manner of wisdom. You have great skill. Look at line two. Words, which the Proverbs say are an expression of the content of your heart. The pure heart. And here it's tied to the treacherous man who is one and the same as the fool, the wicked. So again and again, the blessing of life goes to the wise, while the fool takes a course that brings nothing but frustration and heartache and ultimate destruction, death. Just the week that I was doing this proverb, the headline in the paper was a billionaire who leapt off a balcony four or five floors up now, I thought to myself, the world says if you're rich, you've got everything. But his act, his act was a contradiction of what the world says. How about what the Lord Jesus said? He said, life does not consist in the abundance of the things that a man possesses. Life consists in a relationship with the living God. If you've got that, you've got everything. And to have everything and not have that, you have nothing. And his leap into the concrete, I thought, was an excellent testimony. You want to be wise? You want to think straight? Of course we all do. Then follow the Scriptures. Follow the Word of God. When I was in the natural gas business back two decades ago, I actually did some business with one of the men from Believer's Chapel. He had at that time left, but I recognized him, he recognized me, and we, he brought me back to his office and we talked a little bit about the crazy natural gas business, but eventually, in a short conversation, we talked about Believer's Chapel. And he said this. He said, you know, Believer's Chapel is the greatest place to learn the Scriptures. 
He said, I can't think of a better place to learn the Word of God than Believer's Chapel. And then he said this, and I wrote it down on a napkin so I would never forget it. He said, but that's not all there is. Well, I, I don't remember how I answered him. I don't remember much about the conversation beyond that point. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. That's all there is. That's all there is. The revelation. The knowledge of God. I went on Easter Sunday to church with my son in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Went to a downtown beautiful church. I went into this auditorium and I was just awestruck with how beautiful it is. It's old Tulsa oil money and the church is a hundred years old and they poured that money into that auditorium. It's unbelievable. And as much as I enjoyed it aesthetically, it didn't sanctify me. The, those surroundings didn't sanctify me. The Word of God is what sanctifies you. Let me explain it this way. The knowledge of God, think of a big bag of water. And underneath you have slits with straws. And the contents of that water goes through those various straws. That bag of water is the knowledge of God. Which means that every outflow of your spiritual life comes from that bag. The knowledge of God. For example, how do I know how to baptize? I have to consult the Word of God. How do I know how to take the Lord's table? I have to consult the Word of God. How do I know how to walk as a Christian? How do I know the conduct of a Christian? It's because of the Word of God. It's the knowledge of God. No, my friends, for somebody to say that's not all there is, they're completely wrong. It is all there is. And you can go to beautiful places and stunning auditoriums, but if you don't have the Word of God, you don't have anything. That's the proverb. Here's 13. The sluggard says there's a lion outside in the midst of the street. As I said, that the word means plaza. And then his testimony, I'll be as good as murdered. The sluggard is always the butt of the jokes in the book of Proverbs. He, it's satirical. He's a pathetic individual. And he has a reputation for being morally deficient. But here's the most important word in the proverb. It's the word says. Why is that the most important word? Because the Word says reveals His heart. And we've now learned that whatever's in the heart comes out of the mouth. This man has no credibility whatsoever. His claim is ridiculous. Which reminds us that you and I cannot be... We cannot afford to have our reputation soiled. Be labeled. No, but that's what he has. And so here is his claim. And his claim matches his behavior. He opens his mouth, revealing to us his heart. And that's the word says. So let's examine his claim. He says there's a lion outside. Now I want you to look at the word outside. If you have a King James, you have the word without. Something very interesting about that word. It is always in the Old Testament 
tied to, associated with an object. For example, outside, a camp, a house, a tent, a city wall. Which makes his claim absurd. What's his claim? That there's a lion inside the city. Lions are plentiful in the forest in the Old Testament, but there's not one instance anywhere of a lion being in the center of a city. Streets, plaza. What were they in the ancient Near East? Well, they were bustling with people. Bedouins everywhere. Merchants, traders. They were, had military people. Bedouins coming from every direction. And he's claiming that there's a lion inside there. You see, the term opposite, without, plaza, or street are contradictory terms. Now we're looking at the befuddled, confused mind of the fool. And they're all the same. They're all a mass of contradictions. They are a jigsaw puzzle without pieces. That's the mind of a fool. Now observe, attached is his imaginary consequence. I'll be murdered in the streets. And so he presumes the outcome, which we're never permitted to do in the New Testament. We live by faith. God's the author of our day, every day. We can't assume anything. We trust the Lord every moment of every day of our life. I was... uh, I'm particularly moved this week with Seth and Tori and she losing her mother made me reflect. I, I was particularly moved by Mark's testimony last week. Uh, going to the car and getting the message that his father was now with the Lord. I think about Larry Hairston calling me that my friend Don Strong is gone. I think of getting a call from Jeanette Duncan that my friend Dan's mother had just collapsed and she was with the Lord. It's so unsettling. The anxieties of life, of our day. That's life. That's where we are. Jesus addresses it full force. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink. Is not the body more valuable what you put on? Is not life more than food? Body more than clothing? See the birds? They neither sow, reap, gather in barns, and your your heavenly Father feeds them. So let me ask you, are you anxious today? What are you anxious about? Oh, that's just me. Well, I don't think it should be. I have seen anxiety full force. I've seen it in children. I've seen it in grown-ups. I've seen it in some of the toughest men I ever met. In the oil patch. Fingers that thick. I've seen panic ride over them like a blanket covers a man. When I get those inclinations, what I do is I take myself through a little tutorial. I want to share that with you for a moment. Because we all have these anxieties in life. I ask myself, self, is God sovereign? or not? Self, is God the God of providence or not? And then I try to think of a story 
that quickly comes to my mind from the Scriptures, and I try to insert myself into that story. In Matthew chapter 14, the familiar story of uh, the disciples out on the boat, and they're not making any headway, getting battered around by the wind and the waves, and our Lord Jesus comes out to them on the water, and they see this image, and it's terrifying to them, but He speaks. And Peter recognizes that voice. And he says, Lord, if that's You, bid me to come. And that's where I insert myself in the story. I say, and bid me to come too. And so, Peter, now he's Peter the Great. He gets out of that boat. He couldn't see him, but he could hear him. And he recognized the voice, and he begins to walk. And he does the impossible. He defies every law of physics and nature that we have. Somebody shouts, it was a miracle. No, John Calvin puts it much more precisely. It's all a providence, he tells us. There's general providence. That's the predictable things like the spring that we are now into, and then the hot summer, and then the fall. Those are predictable providences. And then there are the special providences that seem to contradict the general, all the laws and the rules that he established, what we know to be the laws of nature, gravity and such. So that's what Calvin would say. Smart theologian. And, of course, we know the story. You don't need to go through the details. He's making his way to the Lord Jesus, and he takes his eyes off him because, you know, the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. And as he's sinking, Howard Hendricks, our professor, said he called out the shortest and most effective prayer in all of the Scriptures. Lord, save me. And he did. Elizabeth Elliot began her radio show with quoting Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Great verse. Well, Peter got a hold of one of those flesh and blood arms, and he pulled him right out of the water, and they walked back to the boat. What a story. And then what I do after inserting myself in it and trying to think through is I just summarize. So here's my summary. One voice. One voice. And instantly, Peter the Great is fortified with courage to do something that's beyond comprehension getting out of that boat in the middle of wind and waves. Where did he ever get that idea? But then we read what Paul tells us in the book of Romans. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes from the Word of God. He heard that voice. So we have one voice, but we have two walks. See, the walk to and the walk back. And walking to, he's strengthened, and he does the impossible. Walking back with help. Now, I want to put a precise point on that word walk. And sometimes I have to use an extra verse or two just to get it down perfectly precise, what I'm thinking through. And so here it is, the word walk, Genesis 17, 1. Abraham was 99 years old. And the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, walk 
before me and be thou blameless. Now, what's that all about? Well, Abraham didn't have an heir. And we now learn that the problem wasn't Abraham. He had Ishmael. The problem was Sarah. But now he's 99. And now he is unable. And isn't it interesting that all this time goes by, but he waits until he is unable to physically have an heir that God chooses to reveal that name, El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? Here it is. The God of all sufficiency. The God of strength when you have none. The God of capability when your jar is empty. That's El Shaddai. And that was the walk back to the boat. So here's our testimony. It's Proverbs 28.1. The wicked flee, but no one's pursuing. That's the fool that sees the lion in the streets. That's the fool's cluttered mind. What is he? He's, uh, he's living by chance. He's living by luck. He's, he's, uh, he's guessing this. He's superstitious about that. That's the cluttered mind of the fool. But what does the proverb say about the righteous? that heard the word, recognize the voice. Peter is the one. He did something that no one else has ever done in the entire history of the creation. And in doing that, what did he teach you and me? Here's what he taught us. The safest place is to be where the Lord is. Wind and waves, chaos around us, death suddenly comes, and we have these feelings of anxiety through the loss. That's the wind and the waves. The wind and the waves of life. But where is the strength and stability it's where the Lord is. Because you're never going to be lost. He's always going to know where to find you. He's always going to be responsive to your prayers. He's the God of all comfort. The safest place to be is with the Lord. Whatever the circumstances in life may be. And that's the proverb. And I'm out of time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for these people that desire to know your heart, which is wisdom, the skill for living. And give them that great sense of peace because where you are, they want to be. And that is strength to live beyond the circumstances, the winds and the waves of life. Grant them 
your grace, guidance, and mercy to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen.